Welcome to Showcase. We're colorblind, reading Moroccan comics, and still trying to figure out Banksy. Serving the customer is merriment enough for me. Thank you, come again. Should only non-white actors voice non-white cartoon characters? A comic book artist fights for women's rights in Morocco. And is this the face of Banksy? Colorblind casting, the term mainly describes actors portraying characters of a different race. And while it's being done away with in iconic shows like The Simpsons and Family Guy, it's also celebrated in Broadway musical Hamilton. Confused? We'll try to explain. I was elected to lead, not to read. The Simpsons, Family Guy, Big Mouth, Central Park. All these animated series are re-evaluating who gets to voice a cartoon character amid a larger cultural conversation about race and representation. Oh, black! You flipped the script! That means white actors are stepping down from their roles of voicing non-white characters. And there has been a torrent of criticism about it for years. Then this June, things began to change. Jenny Slate from Netflix comedy Big Mouth and Kristen Bell from Apple TV Plus' Central Park quit their jobs voicing biracial characters. Producers of The Simpsons followed, announcing they would stop using white actors to voice non-white roles. Please do not offer my god a peanut. The move may have also ended the controversy about the most famous Indian cartoon character on American television, Apu. Crusted with <laughs> Oh well. Even though Hank Azaria, the voice of Apu for almost three decades, stepped down from the role in January, the creator Matt Groening had faced pressure for saying Apu wouldn't be written off the show. Family Guy also fell in line, with actor Mike Henry saying he'll no longer voice Cleveland Brown after a two-decade run. But before the subject of colorblind casting can be wrapped in a neat little bow, enter Hamilton. The Broadway hip-hop musical features non-white actors to portray the white man's club known as America's Founding Fathers. My name is Alexander Hamilton. It's an aspect of the show that critics have called refreshing and has contributed to Hamilton's wins at multiple awards shows. But isn't this colorblind casting? According to the director Thomas Crail, he says the diverse cast of actors fulfills the show's mission, telling The Guardian it helps it feel relevant and hold a mirror to society. A toast to the groom. So the question remains, is the entertainment industry cancelling colorblind casting or defining who's allowed to do it? Let's go to New Orleans and speak to actor Brittany Williams. Hi, Brittany. Thanks so much for coming on our show. So, Hi. let's just start with this. Do you think that colorblind casting can be a solution to diversity issue on stage? Um, I think that if we existed in a bubble, um, their uh, race had no meaning, then colorblind casting could possibly be a solution. Um, I think I like to refer to something known as color conscious casting. Um, and that's where you, you make an effort to cast someone a certain way, mm -hmm. um, despite whatever your pre preconceptions are. I would argue that uh, with Hamilton, it's color conscious casting. They decided intentionally to cast black actors in these um, roles of his historical figures who were white. So it's not, um, they didn't go into this blindly and just say, whoever we're going to put in here, we're going to put in here. They said, we want to cast people of color, actors of color in these roles. So I think that could help. But the colorblind thing gets into a little bit of flattening in a way. Okay, so uh, I wanted to talk about Hamilton in detail, but before we do that, can you please uh, tell us about what you think is the difference between color conscious uh, casting and colorblind casting? What exactly is the difference? 
Yes. So colorblind casting is this idea that um, you can just go in and um, the, it's a it's the hope that you can go in and cast based on talent, regardless of race. Um, and the problem is the audience very intentionally sees race. You can't erase like our understanding of what it means to be black. You can't erase our understanding of what it means to be Vietnamese. You can't erase our understanding of what it means to be Indian or indigenous. Mm -hmm. So you run into issues with um, say, just going in and casting however you want um, and ignoring the differences between people. With color conscious casting, you decide very intentionally to go in and um, and cast with a specific race and understanding that the layers and differences and um, history that person or that particular race will bring with them. Um, it can be argued that colorblind casting is what they do with um, when they cast white actors in roles, um, especially voice acting um, in roles where they play characters of color. Okay, so. so considering the fact that you think Hamilton, Hamilton's casting was color conscious instead of colorblind, do you think that they did a good job in being anti-racist in their casting strategies? <laughs> That's a layered question. Um, I think that they, they, I think they did a good job in being anti-racist with their casting decisions. Um, even with the success of Hamilton, um, black actors only make up 9% of the principal actors on Broadway. Um, so with that, they kind of increased that number by showcasing these wonderful performers who may not have had another um, or have had few, fewer opportunities to show themselves. Uh, the issue comes with the actual historical figures they're portraying. Um, there is, uh, in all of the brilliance of the show, it does gloss over um, slavery and how George Washington, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson especially, uh, the Schuyler family were all involved in the slave trade. Um, and it completely ignores any um, existence, any consequences, any historical presence of indigenous people. So it's like, it's wonderful that they gave these black and brown actors these roles, but it ended up erasing black and brown people from history. So it's mm -hmm. like a double edged sword there. Okay, so I mean, on the surface, it looks great for, 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 I think, a lot of people. But then there comes the question, is it really mm. that great? What's happening in Hamilton? For example, black play playwright, British playwright, um, Winston Pinnock. Uh, she said that when a black actor is cast in a traditionally white part, they're actually cut off uh, from the history of their black body. So is this, is this what's happening in Hamilton, you think? I think in a way it is, um, and it's most jarring with the character of Thomas Jefferson. Um, there's a throwaway line in one of his songs where um, he says, Sally, be a doll, bring me that letter. And understanding what we know about Thomas Jefferson and his history, uh, Sally can only refer to Sally Hemings, the woman who was his uh, wife's half-sister and who he held as a slave and, and um, sexually abused for all of her life and also kept all of the children they had together enslaved as well. So it's like that being a a black actor singing that line allows it to be thrown away in um, a, a quite jarring, um, historically dishonest way. Okay. So, I mean, we're talking about, about different strategies, obviously. How can we be more diverse without ignoring race and the implications of race and colored bodies? And how can we stop flattening and expanding all the complexities that accompany, you know, colored skin? Right, it's, it's a, <laughs> it, when you lay it out, it sounds difficult and insurmountable and impossible. But um, it's something as simple as inviting the people you cast to bring that to their roles. Um, if you look at what Sandra Oh has done with her character on Killing Eve, she brought a lot of her own cultural experiences into that character, and it gave us a more fuller, a more full understanding of her as a person in a way that we wouldn't have gotten if 
you know, it had been just, um, if it had been a, an actor who wasn't um, able to bring that in, and it could be argued that she brings that in because she is in a position of power with that particular show. Um, you see with uh, characters when you have, um, for example, the character of Apu in The Simpsons, who has been voiced by Hank Azaria, who is an amazing actor, but is white. Um, the character becomes a, a stereotype. It's not, um, there's a, an inauth inauthenticity there that, um, that wouldn't necessarily be there if you had an Indian actor or an Indian immigrant or someone who was from that experience playing the character. And then you have real people in the real world who have to live with um, this stereotypical example being their only um, representation. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to look at who's in the room um, and invite people to bring themselves there. Um, and you, it's, whiteness is just as violent to white people as it is to people of color in that it flattens all um, cultural heritage they may have into this like non-existent um, uh, thing. Yeah. It's just whiteness, is, it erases Irish heritage, it erases English heritage, it erases French heritage, it erases Spanish heritage. So yes. we should all invite each other to, to be more, um, to bring more of our history with us into hopefully. these roles. Well, hopefully we see that happen on stage and uh, different casting strategies. Thank you so much, Brittany Williams, for joining us on Showcase today. Movie theatres are closing down, either temporarily or permanently, because of the coronavirus. But the problems facing historic cinemas began long before the pandemic, from California to Bangkok. Here's why some of them have shut their doors. The Century Cinema in Corte Madera, California, had been operating for more than 50 years until it shut down recently. You would think the coronavirus is to blame, but actually, its lease ran out and wasn't renewed. Same story goes for Istanbul's Rex Cinema, that permanently closed in late March. As for Atlas Cinema, another landmark movie theatre in a different part of the city, it had to shut its doors because Turkey's Ministry of Culture and Tourism plans to reopen it as a cinema museum. But the latest historic movie theatre that filmgoers and its owner were sorry to say goodbye to was Bangkok's Scala. For the past decade, it had been struggling to stay profitable due to competition from multiplexes and new media. When we look toward the future, I don't know if businesses will pick up. Anyhow, the lease expires at the end of this year, so I decided to stop the business now. The iconic Art Deco cinema that opened in 1969 is a place where a lot of people who grew up in Bangkok came to see movies. This is a place where there's a lot of collective memory of the people who, who grew up in Bangkok. And as a symbol, it's, 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 it's a place of elegance. It's a place where cinema is celebrated. Uh, whereas in the modern era of multiplex, uh, cinemas are uh, utilitarian. Fans who came to pay their respects one last time before the cinema closed for good were emotional. When I was a teenager, I came to see movies here with my boyfriend, who is now the father of my children. We would come from different parts of Bangkok to see movies here. The scholar is like an actor, going to say goodbye to his audience. And everyone who has come today feels the same as me. If it's possible, I don't want it to close. And while the multiplexes might seem like the villain of this story, just like an actual movie, there's an even bigger bad at the end, and its name is online streaming. Perhaps classic movie theatres and multiplexes could somehow coexist with a common enemy. And now for a quick look at some of the stories from the world of arts and culture.
Art historian Frank Popper, who influenced generations of artists, has passed away at the age of 102. Popper's studies was the first to look at the intersection between technology and modern art. He was best known for elevating the development of virtual art. The UK art shows Freeze London and Freeze Masters have been cancelled over the coronavirus pandemic. The fairs, which were to take place in October, will be replaced with online viewing rooms. Freeze New York did something similar with a virtual show last May. Well, despite record numbers of coronavirus cases across the United States, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art is reopening. After a nearly four-month hiatus, the museum is welcoming its visitors with new social distancing restrictions. The nearby Norman Rockwell Museum and the Clark Art Institute are also expected to open their doors. A Moroccan comic book artist has had enough of the sexism she faces every day on the streets of Casablanca, and she's using the pages of her work to combat the abuse. Nursena has more. Zainab Farsaki has been the target of daily street harassment in both the cities of Fez and Casablanca. Then in 2017, she was greatly affected by her government. Morocco's legislature had rejected all 44 UN recommendations to improve women's rights. They included measures to curtail child marriages and marital rape. Farsaki had enough. She would later speak out through her illustrations by producing the book Hashima or Shame. In my work, I draw myself and I draw the body of several women. It's a way for me to express resistance and to explain to Moroccan society that the female body is not just an object for sex, but it can be an artistic subject. And this is one of the ways to solve the problem of harassment, the rape culture, and to respect the woman and her body, too. But the harassment didn't stop at the street. Farsaki was a mechanical engineering student, a rarity for someone of her gender in the country. She says she and her fellow female students faced an onslaught of sexism from other students. However, through her drawings, Farsaki says, I'm here and I can change some things. The artist must not fall into the trap of satisfying the public. The artist must disturb, they must draw, they must create the art that provokes the public. Not just to provoke, but also to debate subjects that were always hashuma, shame. And therefore, the artist for me is the only courageous professional who uses art to finally discuss these subjects. It's important to note that Farsaki's work isn't just about change. She says igniting new debate about gender norms is also a form of therapy because she's not just an activist, but also someone trying to cope with the unjust. Paris's National Ballet has faced workers' strikes, a major resignation and a lockdown. Now its dancers are returning to the stage, but is the turbulence over? Palais Garnier, one of Paris's most prestigious opera houses, is welcoming its ballerinas back for the first time since March. After months of training over video chats, these Parisian dancers are excited to jump back into their routines. I was quite surprised when I went back to class. It came back quite naturally though. And it feels good to be here. It's a complete moral booster. But before the coronavirus pandemic, the ballerinas were already facing turbulent times. First, Opera House's leadership fell apart in 2016. Its director, Benjamin Millipi, resigned after being on the job for only a year. He had promised to radically shake things up at a 159-year-old institution, but he then reportedly grew frustrated with the slow pace of change. 
Then, more disruption came earlier this year. After the dancers and staff took part in France's age-old tradition of going on strike. Ballet dancers receive a full pension when they turn 42. And the government proposed to change that. It has indeed been a difficult year. First, the dancers were deprived of their theatre because of the strikes. Then, in a way, they were deprived of their bodies because of the virus. It's extremely painful for them. There is a real overflowing desire to dance and to get back to the company and the audience and the stages. The comeback has been a slow process. Social distancing measures have limited training classes to 10 dancers per room. And the clock is ticking for a show in December. We're currently working on the reconditioning of the dancers, therefore working closely with sports doctors at the opera, which is growing day by day, so for the moment we're helping them to regain confidence, regain their level, find their musculature. All that is in progress so that we can be in very good shape for the return in the fall. And that return, amidst a pandemic, strikes and leadership squabbles, seems hopeful for the future as next year's calendar remains intact for now. So, while ballet has become a tad more mainstream over the years, it's a costly art form to learn. But a dance company in Nigeria hopes to change that. Here's Zainab. Bumpy and muddy not a very suitable surface to be performing a pirouette, but it's a piece of cake for Anthony Majo, who is a student at the Leap of Dance Academy in Lagos. Back at the school, pupils are preparing for their rehearsal. Normally, these suburban kids couldn't afford the ballet equipment, but the studio has them covered. And reach back as far as you can. The school's founder is self-taught dancer Daniel Ajala. He opened it in 2017 after studying the dance moves online and in books. For my years of understanding and reading about ballet, I know that ballet is actually for people who have actually um, who have, who have money who are from very high class because ballet is expensive. And in this area, I know that we can actually afford the luxury of ballet or dance education. So I think it's actually a very beautiful art to introduce to our people here because it will actually help them to know that this can be done also by themselves, by indigenous people. So I want them to be able to enjoy what is happening abroad or other places. Thank you. Ajala managed to recruit more children as time went by. Today, he has 12 students aged between 6 and 15. But when he first started teaching, some of the residents in the neighborhood weren't so happy with what they saw. When we started ballet here, people were like, what are they doing? Is it not so indecent? No, 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 it's not a Christian dance because the area is like a mix of religious people. And like, no, 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 they have to wear all those revealing clothes and they have to lift their legs up and all of those things. So we were just trying to make sure that, orient them that this is not a bad dance. It's not a, an indecent dance. In fact, ballet is a very disciplined form of dance that is very, very important in the group of the child. Olamide Olawole is one of the older students. She hopes what she learns at the academy will pave the way to achieve her own goals in life. My dream is to make children around the world to be able to share the same dance experience, the ones that are interested in learning dance. I want them to, to be able to express their feelings through dance, and maybe one day I'll become a dance teacher too, I'll be able to gather children to, and teach them how to dance. Some estimates say raising a professional ballerina can cost around $100,000. So it's fair to say what Leap of Dance Academy is doing for these kids is priceless. We're almost done with this episode of Showcase. Please remember to like, follow and subscribe to our YouTube, Insta and Twitter accounts. But before we go, the underground artist Banksy has made a rare appearance on a literal underground train. Thank you.